I don't understand how in the world do people get married and they hate, because that's what it has to come, hate somebody to the point that they will get their own son's mother locked up over something like this. It was really a slap in the face, you know, for me, like, you protected this person for so long. You hadn't even spoke out about your abuse. You haven't even, you know, talked about the real trauma that you got from that marriage. It was a lot of aha moments that I needed just for my myself and my growth and, and accepting things and coming to the realization of where I was and actually being married to someone that now seeks pleasure in your pain. I aim to make emotional healing a global norm through cultivating candid discussions about love. My parents got married and divorced to each other three times. Or you can look at it as they kept trying. In the end of my father's life, that's what he told me. I aspire to mend marriages. I'm intentional about loving her mm -hmm. because um, now I understand that, you know, I was able to be free in loving me, then I can love her. Reignite hope for singles seeking future relationships. How can you glory in being single and want a companion at the same time? How can you not? I know. You're only going to be as, as successful as a wife as you were at a single. And inspire men to lead their homes in accordance with biblical principles. When I made my vows, I told God that I was going to take care of this gift. This is my gift. Oh, and I was obligated to see after him and him alone. Join me on this journey where these heartfelt and vulnerable conversations form the patchwork for the quilt that will envelop my future wife. I have uh, accepted their opinions without criticism. And uh, the theme is that I'm happy and I want to be happy in the future. I'm the Terrace R. Whitfield. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, the Terrace R. Whitfield. Listen, this is season eight. Are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, come on, y'all. I mean, we got to do better than this. Can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. And you'll notice in the description a link for you to sign up for the mailing list. A lot of y'all have been getting on to me when we've been doing these retreats and these um, these events. And you say, Lateris, like, can you send an email out to notify us when you're coming to my city? And so I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. All right. I've heard your cries. I've heard your complaints. And in 2024, I'm going to rise to the occasion. And we're developing this mailing list so that I can reach out to you and have some some great touch points. Well, listen, today's episode, I got a buddy on the podcast, good old friend, and so we're going to chop it up. We're going to have a conversation. I don't even know the title of the episode. We're just going to talk and have fun. You saw this person on last year's episode that we did in March at New Birth. Um, she was a part of the panel. You also saw her on the first season of Love and Marriage Huntsville. Without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast, my homie, Destiny Payton. All, all five seasons, by the way. Uh, all five seasons? <laughs> five seasons? So hold on. So when Mine's the last one. Mine's the last. So it, it was that many seasons? Yeah. Show's been on since 2019. Okay. So that's what it was. Okay. Because I kept hearing people like, well, what happened to you or whatnot? I didn't know that it was five seasons and then you just disappeared. And what happened? Why did you disappear? Well, you know, uh, what had happened was... Uh -huh. What had happened was... That's when, <laughs> when black folks would tell a story, they always start off with what had happened was. All right, so what had happened was... Um, the, the political answer is contractual issues. Uh -huh. Yeah, that okay. would be why I didn't okay. return. So it has something to do with money, pretty much. <laughs> See, see, black folks, you know, you know, we keep a lid on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. So basically, they wasn't trying to run you your coins the way you wanted your coins. I understand. I understand. All right. And so um, since then, how have how have you been doing? Man, I uh, <laughs> I made a post. Now that we're in 2024, I, 2023 was, but did you die? Yeah. Mm. I'm still alive. <laughs> still alive. I'm Why'd still you alive. say that, but did you die? What happened in 2023 where you felt like, all hell broke loose. What didn't happen? Um, just so much. You know, the divorce that I had <laughs> ended in 2021 has been drug on until 2024. How does that happen? How does a divorce that's that's 
supposed to be over, how does it still continue to drag on? I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah, I didn't either. So what, what do you mean so by that? So the other party can reopen the divorce case at any time. You can pay an extra fee apparently and and start to um, request contempts. Huh? Yeah. You can open up. You can open. Okay, so you still... So typically people reopen a divorce because in the decree you may want to modify some things, right? Yeah. Maybe you modify child support. Yeah. I don't get that, so that's not even in there. So... Um, well, you don't get child support? I don't. For real? Correct. I ain't, ain't letting black men get off like that? What, what, well, what? I let black men get off like that. Oh, so you didn't, so you didn't put them on child support? No. Oh, okay. Why? Because you felt like it was even like y'all split the kid up like 50-50? No, because my son was only... When our divorce was final, I want to say he might have been eight months. He wasn't one yet. And so for me, it was like, I just wanted to be over. I gave everything down to the silverware, everything that he requested. Hmm. Pots and pans, silverware, blender, everything. Hmm. So what's, what's, well, is it still a legal issue where you can't discuss what's going on, why it's dragging on, or do, are you at liberty to say that? I can say, I. Uh, I, yeah, I'm at liberty to say. Okay, well, what, why is it dragging on? Why, why, why is it reopened? If there's no um, child support issue, uh, no custody visitation, no custody. Issues. So what's what? What else is there? I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? You got to see something on the paperwork. The thing says. that has always been requested is that uh, I be. It's it's a punitive type thing. It's always hold her in contempt and put her in jail. For what though? Where would you be held in contempt for? Um, let's see what, what what would we say would be on the list. Talking about said person in interviews. Oh, so we which should... is not even in our decree, by the way. Oh, okay, so it ain't no gag order about that. <laughs> no, the only thing that I, I I said that I wouldn't talk about him, um, or his family or anybody on the show, Love and Marriage Hunts. Okay, I agree to that. And then so he feels as though if you're talking about him in interviews that. Is the same thing. Is that in the divorce decree? No, it's or not. Or it's just a, a verbal agreement y'all had between each other? We never had that agreement. You just felt as from a moral standpoint, you just wouldn't mention him on the show? Correct. Oh, no, that's in the decree. Okay. That's in the decree. But interviews, yeah, from a moral standpoint, I didn't want to mention him on the show. And I felt like keeping my silence about what was going on would protect my son. And I realized that keeping my silence only allow a lot of the things that were going on in my marriage to continue and me having to sit in narratives and, and different things that weren't real, weren't actual or factual. And it, I feel like it hurt me more than it, it helped the situation because I was in protective mode of the person that I had a son with. So how did it hurt you? Because they were still allowed to abuse me in other ways, judicial system, financial, and... I never saw that coming. So when you say financial, was he the major breadwinner in the in the uh, home? No, he wasn't. But what I asked for in our, the only thing that I did ask for was one year of him paying the mortgage on the home. And I was refinancing the home in my name. And um, I did, but he refused to give me the mortgage statement. But the story that's put out into the world is that I was squatting in my own home that I owned. <laughs> And I wouldn't get out. And this man has supported me and did so much for me. And I should be able to, you know, move forward. But I didn't think for a whole year that I would be in court. I would be so, paying so legal fees. So you had an agreement to what? You were supposed to move out after a year? or what? I was going to ref. I was either going to move, sell the home or refinance the home. And so I did refinance the home. But I, I the mortgage is in his name, All not right. mine. So I had to have, because he had a VA loan, I had to have the mortgage statement in order to finalize the closing. Right. And we tried without it, but the underwriter just was like, no, we had to have it. And then he wouldn't he wouldn't give you the the no. mortgage statement? No. So I saw something one morning. So we're gonna talk about the elephant in the room. I woke up one morning and I see you on live surrendering yourself to the jail <laughs> system. What is it? The Huntsville Detention Center? What was it called? But Huntsville HPD. Yeah. I saw you. I was like, is this real? What is going on? And it was real. Very real. And I talked to you after you got out. What was that about? So um, <laughs> I get a call from Martel. And he's like, hey, man, you all right? And I'm like, what you talking about? 
He was like, I- I'm so, I'm, I'm pissed off right now. What is going on? And I'm like, what are you? He's like, yo, I'm Crime Stoppers. And I said, well, get off my phone. And I hung up on him. And then you he, was on Crime Stoppers? I was on Crime Stoppers. And the only reason why I was on Crime Stoppers was because of who I am. Yeah. Because I met someone that was actually retired from the board of Crime Stoppers. The next day is how Crazy Guy works. And they were like, we would never put something yeah, like that on Crime that's Stoppers. that's so petty. That's Four petty. days after the charge. Like, it wasn't like you were looking for me. Like, you can't, you can't find me in Huntsville. You called me on the phone. Just like, <laughs> hey, that's what you doing? Yeah. Uh, like, um, but you know what? The thing that was meant to, and it, and it was embarrassing. Uh, yeah. And it, it was meant to embarrass me, but it also protected me. Because. Let me tell you something that's interesting. And I just want to chime in. You handled that such, like a G. Like, I, you wasn't even, I know it may have been meant to embarrass you, but. You didn't seem embarrassed by it. Like, what made you go on live? Because you could have not told anybody that. You could have just went in, uh, surrendered. You know, your dad was g- feeling what he was feeling, all that stuff, and then went and got out and then never mentioned it. Because it was done publicly. And that was the first time I ever responded to anything that had happened to me in my dealing with my ex-husband publicly because he put he made it public. So how else do I respond? How did you get on Crime Stoppers or something like that? Somebody made a call. <laughs> somebody knew somebody. Had to. Because literally, uh, you know, when I was talking to an investigator, they're like, you know, typically we do that when we're looking for someone. Yeah. And I said, well, it. I was just charged four days ago. And that how did it, like, that was quick. That is crazy. It was absolutely set up to be embarrassing. And the thing that was the biggest gift about being on Crime Stoppers was I could have been I could have been seized or pulled over with my son or in a grocery store with my son. And I know what it's like to watch a parent be arrested. I've seen my mother do it. I've seen, I, how do I say this without? Uh, uncovering somebody. No, no, not even uncovering somebody. Just, just dealing with my own trauma. So to watch my mother be arrested and me and my brother be taken away from her and then having to wait in the foster system for somebody to come and get us. You was in a foster care? You, you grew up in foster care? I was in foster care, yeah. For how long? Um, It's a blur for me, but I don't think it was a probably a year. Yeah, me and my brother were in a group home first, and then we, we ended up being separated and going to actual uh, individual homes. And then our grandparents got, my grandmother got, my mother's mother got my brother and my dad's mother got me while my dad was fighting for custody of me. And the thing that I didn't want, I'm happy and grateful for, is that it didn't, the, uh, I guess you would say, the generational, yeah, generational curse, curse yeah. didn't happen to my son because I could have been arrested and he could have been taken from me in that moment. And that probably would have broke me. Now, you didn't see me looking like I was embarrassed, but that, if that yeah. would have happened, so. How old were you when you, uh, when your mom got uh, arrested or whatnot, you got placed in foster care? Um, I was four, four, five. Yeah, I was four, four and a half. And so eventually your mom, did she end up getting custody of you again? Nope. My dad ended up getting custody of me. Really? Mm-hmm. So your dad, uh, you were raised with your dad? I am a daddy's girl all day. That's why you saw him right there. And people yeah. are like, why are you taking your dad through that? Like, he's like, I'm coming. I'm, I'm coming. Because he, he said he looked at it on his phone. It, it popped up on his phone. and his. It came up as a notification? Yeah. As a father, if I, <laughs> good Lord, as a father. I want to tell the story that he told me that went, that, that, that the things that he did after he saw it. As a 72 year old man that's battling cancer and to have his only child going through that. So he saw that pop up. Um, you've experienced that. How did you, so when Martell called you and told you that, then what, how long before you decided to turn yourself in? The next day. The next day. What was that decision like? It was hard. It was a hard decision, but it was like, what's the process? What do I need to do? And how quickly can I go through it to get back out? Did you have an attorney working with you on that? I did. did, And they told you just go ahead and just turn yourself in, you get back out? Funny thing is... (laughs) I actually had a meeting with my divorce attorney the next day. And so I'm in her office to talk about responding to him reopening the divorce case. And um, I had to tell her, hey, I was on crime stoppers. Like, what do I do? And then she had to refer me to a criminal attorney that I now have to pay to go and get the, you know, get the advice that I need to turn myself in and then make an appointment to go down and prepare for this charge that I have to fight. 
And what was the charge for? Forgery in the third. And, it, you know, Crime Stoppers said blatantly, you know, Destiny Peyton Williams forged her, her ex-husband's name on a utility contract. A utility contract? Mm -hmm. So was this something that y'all had? Like, help me understand this, because this sounds real petty to me that became a, a legal issue. Explain what that means. I'm sitting in jail asking, what am I here for? Because I didn't know what it meant either. I don't have any utility contracts with his name on it. Never have. So it's like saying basically that you went and got the electricity in his name. Is that what they're trying to say? Or you got like a water bill in his name? Um, I think so. That I that I forged his name on it. When I don't have any, and I, I mean, it's only so much that I can say because yeah. we're still legally yeah. in, the, in the fight and I want my attorney yeah. to be trying to box me when I get home. But, um. <laughs> like, did you even bring that up? <laughs> But I can say this for sure: I do not have and never have had any utility bills in his name. It's only been in my name. My question has always been like, and this is this is this is the part that grieves my heart, is that you can marry someone, be in love, not in love, whatever. But one can make a decision to marry somebody, and the marriage don't work out. File for divorce have kids, not have kids, different people have different scenarios in the situation. But how does it get to the point to where one would put their ex in jail over something as petty as that? Like, I don't even, I don't even, I try to wonder that because like even my ex-wife and I, I, I talk about this in the past. I've cheated on her in our past marriage. She don't hate me like that. Like, it's, it's not where she'll... She will do anything to harm me at all. You know what I'm saying? Even when it came time for me to get the new home that uh, that I purchased a couple of months ago, I called up. We don't talk all the time, but I was like, hey, you want to get this money? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a nice little commission. You want to come get this check? She said, heck yeah. So she came, just wrote her name on the, because it, it was a new bill. All she had to do was write her name on it, made her $25,000 just like that. Go make your money. Go, go live. I don't understand how in the world do people get married and they hate because that's what it has to come hate somebody to the point that they will get their own son's mother locked up over something like this like couldn't that have been handled in a conversation i don't know what y'all's communication is like or whatever but could that have been whatever it was that happened and i know you can't say too much about it but could that have been handled in the conversation to say, hey, guess what? I've noticed this right here happened. Hey, can you make sure that you take my name off of this or whatever? And it just be handled in that. Did y'all have a level of communication where that could have been done, whatever, if that was the case, allegedly, um, could that have been handled in the conversation? Very much so. Very much so. Do y'all have it any type of communication a, with each yeah, other? We do. Is it cordial? Do you have to talk through a third party all the time? It's text. But verbally, y'all can't have a conversation without... I've tried. So it's just a lot of anger between whatever it is where y'all can't... I don't know can't. what it is. I don't know what it is. What, what I will say is, in my experience with, you know, turning myself in, I'm sitting there just like... How did I'm, we get here? I'm really in... I'm, yeah. really in, I'm really in a real jail for something that ain't real and I all the flashbacks to the times that I picked up the phone to, and, and called the police about domestic situations and couldn't pull the trigger yep couldn't couldn't give a name couldn't say his name literally like go through the process multiple times you know detectives calling me press charge press charge and I just couldn't do it and I'm sitting here in real jail for something like this. And it was really a slap in the face, you know, for me. Like, you protected this person for so long. You hadn't even spoke out about your abuse. You haven't even, you know, talked about the real trauma that you got from that marriage. And the lack of protection that you experienced throughout the whole ordeal. And... <laughs> Yeah, it was it was um, it was a lot of aha moments that I needed just for my myself and my growth and and accepting things and coming to the realization of where I where I was and actually being married to someone that now seeks pleasure in your pain. Yeah. 
How does that feel to to reconcile your relationship with this, with your ex-husband to that feeling? Because you still got to do life with this gentleman. You know, you have a son, you still have to do life. Your son is how old? He's three. Three. At minimum of 15 more years. How do you reconcile that and how do you navigate this space you might not even have the answer for it but how do you what is your forethought in all right this is the reality this is where we are this is the father of my son how do we progress from this moment um i don't have the words i always say but god because prayer has got me to this point and a lot of therapy a lot of life coaching, um, specific therapy now is trauma-based, EMDR therapy to deal with yeah. the trauma. And because I had to go next level, regular therapy was good, but yeah. we need to go deeper because that relationship started to bring up old triggers and traumas from my childhood. Things that, you know, I wanted as a kid and didn't get, which was protection. I, I keep going back to that because I just in some of the most vulnerable states of my life being pregnant after five miscarriages and having this miracle baby and then walking out of the hospital with a $20,000 bill because my husband at the time refused to acknowledge me on his insurance. So those were, I mean, just the consistent. You said refuse to acknowledge you on the insurance. Explain that to me. We're talking about. So for punishment of not naming his son a junior, he refused to confirm me um, during discharge as his wife on his insurance. Doesn't it? So you, so you were stuck with a $20,000 bill? Mm-hmm. While I was married. Okay. All right. Um, explain to people what that level of therapy was. It? It's EMDR. What's it mm -hmm. called? EMDR. It's, it stands for, uh, I forgot the acronym. Don't ask me. <laughs> Rect reticular. It's something, but they'll do, explain what happens. You can do light therapy in your eyes and explain. It's various things. I haven't really gotten deep into the, the physical aspect because my initial therapist was remote. And she had an incident where while she was doing light therapy, her internet went out and it was traumatizing to her because you're opening you're stuck. up. Yeah. You're just you, stuck over here. Yeah. You open up some things for a person and you can't get them get back. back. Mm -hmm. So I now have one in person. So I get to the next level of the more uh, physical work. Cause you know, initially they have you go through, you know, start, start with your earliest memory and then, you know, keep going. By the time I got to, I want to say seven or eight, I couldn't go anymore. Like I just couldn't take. I was like, "Ooh." What was it doing to your body? It was just. I mean, talking about it now is bringing up stuff. Like I'm a little uneasy, but it just started to. I mean, I started to remember things that I, I mean, completely have forgot. I remember toys that my aunt got me when I was six in a nightgown. Like things started to really come out, and I was just like, "Whoa." Um, it was just a lot of trauma. I had a lot of early trauma that I remembered vividly. Are you open enough to share some of those without yeah. sending you into a spiral? Yeah, I'm open enough. Um, you know, dealing with my mom, you know, her drug addiction. I didn't know what that was at the time, of course. But, you know, seeing her being, you know, jumped on by dr drug dealers looking for their money, um, walking in and the smell of it, you know, those things I remember. And... Um, you know, being uh, touched as a little girl and just things that just constantly happen. And I remember, I remember us, like one of my earliest memories was, it's just kind of like, I don't know, you just kind of snap and you remember when you were a little kid pulling up to our apartment and the kids jumping on a mattress next door mm -hmm. to the, to the um, apartment. And I was like, so excited, like, oh, you know, that's a memory. But then when we get inside, we didn't have windows in our bedroom. And then I just remember um, living in a garage. I didn't know it was a garage. My aunt told me she used to hate picking me up from there because she would, I would be in, covered in oil. So my my mom's, I guess, uh, ex-boy or boyfriend at the time, he owned a, 
a, a car garage and fix cars and stuff. And so there was a room in the garage that we lived in. That was another memory that I had. Um, and it's just, you know, those things started to come up. And I was just like, oh, wow, I forgot all about all this stuff. How did you process that to 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 think about those things, especially um, the SA situation? Um, how are you dealing with that? Um, it's interesting because I remember as an adult telling one of my aunts and she was like, yeah, you told us when you were a kid. I'm like, I did. And she's like, yeah, you told us. Cause I always been a very, you know, vocal Open person. Yeah. Vocal kids speak my mind. You ain't going to tell me nothing. And I'm going to tell you. And, but I was like, well, y'all didn't do anything. Like the only reason why me and my brother got taken away from my mother the night that it happened was because I refused to go to their house. And I, I looked at my brother and I said, um, we were at a friend's house playing and one of the, the boys was over there and he's like, they can come to our house. And cause my mom was late picking us up. And I was like, no, my mom said we can't come over your house anymore. And it was not the truth, but you said I, stuff happens over there. Yeah. And my, I had already told my brother and I remember the night that we did the night that we went to spend a night before the incident happened, before we got taken away. And I remember one of them trying to wake me up and my brother saying, no, she's asleep. And I literally was faking because he knew it was going to happen to me. And Was it an older boy or what? Yeah, he was a teenager. And two brothers, actually. And my brother, um, that night that we ended up getting taken away, uh, he stood up and said, yeah, my mama said, we can't come to your house. And so I guess the lady waited and waited, and she ended up calling the police to try to ride around the neighborhood and find her mom. And um, that was the night that we got drove to foster, foster care. How'd you feel? Do you remember that moment, four years old, like you're in this strange place. They done told you you can't go back with your mom. You know, that's very near and dear to me as a licensed foster parent. Um, how did you feel in that moment? Well, the interesting part is after riding around the neighborhood, going back to our house and trying to find my mom, we saw her coming out of this building as we were leaving the neighborhood. And I'm yelling, like, there's our mama, there's our mama. And the police just kept going. And in that moment, I knew, like, they're not, they're not going to take us home. And um, I just remember crying. And I remember my, me and my brother sitting next to each other just crying and them giving us candy. I remember that. And, and then um, the group home that we ended up going to was literally across the street from um, – the 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 office and we walked over there and we watched TV with this older couple and the social worker was there with us and I guess they got us comfortable enough to leave and there were two other girls there and I just remember going upstairs and there were bunk beds and um that was the beginning of like the, the beginning of my new life and so being in this um Abuse of marriage, as you refer to it as, it brought up all that. It brought up all that past trauma. For a long time, I didn't even even recognize it as abuse. So when it first started, it was like, okay, you know, I fought back. And so it took me a long time. My actual lawyer had to say to me, just because you fought back did not make it not be abuse. And I didn't get that. Because um, I mean, you're from Detroit. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, say I've been fighting all my life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and and not that that's a, a good thing, but so it got to a point where um, I was just trying to fix it. I wanted, you know, I, going to therapy and just, I, I was so focused on the end goal that I didn't acknowledge the fact that I was in a situation that may never change. And I was, and this is where I tell people and women that I talk to all the time, do not stay in a relationship for potential. Yeah. And you cannot love an abuser through it. And you just can't. And once they disrespect you on a level of putting their hands on you, there's no turning back. And I didn't understand that in the moment. I really didn't. I just, we're going to go to therapy. We're going to fix this. We're going to go to therapy. Are we going to talk to this other person? Every time we got to the point where it was real work, flight. And then I'm still sitting there by myself like, well, I mean, maybe this is not the right therapist. And I go to another therapist, same situation. To the point where 
I had a therapist say to me that if you don't leave, he will kill you. Let's reverse. You met your ex-husband. How old were you when you met him? And how long did y'all date before y'all got married? Um, we dated for five years. Yeah, five years. We were together a total of seven years. We dated for five years. We were engaged for almost two and a half years. And yeah, it was so all long you, distance. Oh, yeah, it was long distance. So you were in your what, early 30s mm -hmm. or 30s. You met him. He lived where and you lived where? I lived in, I had just moved back from L.A. to Atlanta, and he lived in Huntsville. All right, so he lived in Huntsville. You lived in Atlanta. And then how did y'all meet? We met at a Christmas party. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Because it was interesting. It was interesting how we met. Um, some mutual friends from from high school, one, one of my friends was like, hey, you know, this guy has a crush on you. You need to go talk to him. Now, mind you, it was Christmas, so I had a couple drinks. And, um, you little know, eggnog, the eggnog was eggnog. Knocking. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, OK, girl, you know, and then I just kept, you know, in, mingling and mixing with people at the party. And then finally, when she came back, she's like, no, you need to go talk to him. He's shy. And so I went and sat on his lap and sat on his lap. I did. Hey, I heard you want to meet me. Yeah, hey, Santa. <laughs> I'm your gift. <laughs> what, what you talking about? And he turned completely red, like completely red. And I, and in, in that moment, I just think about the innocence of of all of that. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was really good in the beginning. Pregnant pause moments. So you said that you sat in his lap. From that moment, you said he was more shy. And then y'all were long distance, how did y'all, what was the courtship like, the dating? Because you said y'all dated for five years, so mm -hmm. what was the intentionality back then? Were y'all just getting to know each other? Y'all just dating each other? No potential of marriage? Uh, was it a five-year situationship, or was y'all committed in a relationship, and this is my boo, we we rocking together? Mm -hmm. What what was that? Because it was long distance. It had to stop at some point. It was long distance, but we... um. We were on and we broke up and got back together a lot. But the initial, I guess, the foundation of our relationship, um, I stayed in Huntsville for about six months before I moved to Nashville. And so we were together a lot. And I watched him be a caretaker to his grandparents. And that just made mm -hmm. my heart like, oh my God, he's such a, a good family person. And, you know, even the family dynamics, beautiful family. And I think. I was so caught up in that and, you know, always my family is everywhere. My family's Detroit, Atlanta. So I'm, I was the only um, grandchild out of 29 of us that moved away from Detroit. And here I am in Huntsville is me and my dad. And then my God family, who's a huge, they're, they're my family. Um, other than that, it's like, I've always been solo. I always just moved really by myself. And so to, to be around that family dynamic, it just felt good. And then to watch being a caretaker of his grandparents and how big his heart was um, in the moment. But what I realized, it was kind of like forced on him. And it, it was like when we became a family, I was like, oh, I know he's going to be great to us because he's so good. To, but it was like, I don't know if he just got to a point where he was tired or it was just like, I've done all this work. Now you do the work. Why do you feel like it was forced on him at that, that stage? You know, you could be raised to be the golden child and you, you know, like I've heard even him say, you know, everybody want to make wants to make their mother happy. And I get that you want to make your parents happy and I get that. But to the own detriment of your your own happiness at a certain point, um, I just feel like I got a lot of the backlash from the things that may have just been placed on him too heavily. One of the things that even happened in therapy was um, my ther the last therapist that we had said, you know, the thing that you want the most is protection and he can never give it to you because he's been raised to give it to someone, unfairly raised to give it to someone else. Has he ever been told that? Has the therapist he been the said ther that to his face. Oh, he was there with you. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? Did he agree with that? Because that's a great concept. That's, that's a great 
uh, awareness moment to say, wow, I never thought about that. If I was groomed at a young age to go be this caretaker for whoever it is, mom, grandma, whatever, then, which is a great characteristic when you look at it and be like, wow, that'd be great. He could, he could give me that same level of care, but if it's not managed properly, no, I can only do this and I exhaust this. It's like when you have young boys become the the man of the house too mm-hmm. early and you think that you get married to him, he's going to be, he's like, no, I want to get my child, my, my childhood would, back. Yes. So he was a man from the man of the house from 12 to 17. Now you're dealing with this 40 year old man that says, I want to live my I'm life. I'm still I be a 17. Child. Yes. And he want to go be a child again. You know, he wants to go get those childhood uh, days back. So when that was brought to his attention, do you remember how he responded? Um, we didn't, I don't remember going back after that. So that, that, that major moment happened and y'all didn't unpack that. It was like, Hey, it was like stamped. Like he literally said he can't give it to you. He he can't. He doesn't know how. And he didn't try to disagree and say, yeah, I can't. I, I, I didn't realize that he just let that be what it is. Yes. How did you, did you take that as a lesson or did you say, well, I can, maybe I can love him and he's going to see and he's, he, I know it's in him. And so I'm going to get it out of him. I'm going to extract it out of him for our family. No, I I was good and pregnant. And all I could think about was getting this baby here. And I really went into myself and just tried to like block out everything that was going on around me. And I thought I was doing a good job until I ended up having extremely high blood pressure because my body was reacting. Yes. And so while I'm not reacting to things or giving energy, it's, you know, you still feel it. And that's one of the things that I'm I'm glad you brought up because that's the reason why I say stuff has to be talked about. Stuff has to be dealt with. We sweep so much under the the rug and feel like it's going to, I don't even know if we even think it's going to fix itself out. We just don't even just, we just don't address it. And unaddressed trauma messes up your nervous system like your your body's going to respond to it um and you know we hear the the saying god can't heal what we won't reveal Mm. but the reality of that also is that when that trauma is trapped inside of our nervous system it's going to respond and you're going to get high blood pressure stress you're going to deal that's why a lot of men um have heart attacks earlier than women because they dealing with all this trauma for years women are having them more now african-american women actually why because not only are we the mothers and the caretakers and caregivers, we're working. And back in the day, our job pretty much was to take care of home, kids, and the husband. Now we do all of that and work. And just the, li- the life stressors, too, that, that are different, um, what we have to carry. And so a lot of times people are like, especially black women, they are so strong and masculine. Mm-hmm. We haven't been able to really sit in our femininity and thrive because I've been called a man in every relationship I've been in. Oh, I really? Think, pretty much. So why? What What were they seeing and identifying where they called you a man? And you're talking about back in, not in high school, they, they, they didn't notice those terms back then, did they? Where they say you hard. That's what we say back well, in the no, day. Well, <laughs> even no. Even one of my castmates said, you know, you got the, you, you kind of act, you know, act like a little, you got, you're not a, you a beta male? I was like, no, I'm alpha. Um, <laughs> Get it right now. Big D energy. But um So you said you're an alpha man, not yeah. an alpha woman. Yes, yes. And so <laughs> I I I don't think it was more so what they were seeing. I think it what they probably and what I now understand is the environment that they were creating for me to be in. So if I'm not in an environment where I feel like, oh, this person has me, you know, I haven't had that experience where I feel like wholeheartedly. This person has my back. I don't have to... why, why don't you respond like that to me? I never, I never saw this alpha woman. You don't act like that around me. Really? No, I've never seen. Well, I'll you... say this: one thing with even with this production situation, you it's 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 a big deal. Like it's you walk in and it's a whole production studio. <laughs> you made sure that I, you know, I was taken care of. So I, I felt. But you, but even be beyond this moment, like even when you came out to the Stella Wars, and just anytime I've t- I've talked to you, you don't come off like that. Is that something you've been aware of that you've been trying to change over the last year, or I don't know you well enough for you to show that side? No, I would say I definitely have been doing a lot of work, 
a lot of work. And you also, I don't feel like, you know, the times that we've encountered that you just kind of had me straggling out there. <laughs> Like I, 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 I don't feel like that. Yeah, no. But you said you've been like that, which makes sense because if you had to go into this self preservation mode as a young child from four years old, you didn't have that covering uh, and that nurturing of your mother until whatever that moment happened, whether she reentered your life. When did she reenter your life? Where she? Oh, never. She, okay, okay, that never happened. Uh, so she's around. And when I tell you, I know where I get my strength from. I didn't understand it before. And in, in therapy, I, re, I, I said to my therapist, I was like, you know, I got to a point where I had to put myself in her shoes and look at life through her lens. Yeah. And that's what helped me heal. And then I had another epiphany. I was talking to my life coach and I said, you know, my mother is from Detroit. She survived the epidemic of crack cocaine. And she's still here. She's still in the streets. She's still, you know, day to day fighting. And that's a different level of strength. Also, the pain, because I have seven siblings. Nice. It is eight of us total. By your mom. By my mom. Uh, one that was was murdered, my oldest brother, the only sibling I ever lived with and had a relationship with, because my other siblings have been put into the system. It's three of them I've never met. Like we literally can be in a room together that I, I probably wouldn't. So you're talking about the one that you were raised with, that you went in foster care together. He's he's he's, he's my no protector. Longer, he's no longer here. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. <sighs> Don't do it. I'm not. I'm Don't a, do I'm, it. A, I'm a I'm a I'm a it makes sense. I'm sorry. And that and that's what happens. It's like it just all makes sense. It's like here, even when you talk about as kids, where he was like, my mama said, he listened to what you said. He he took note of those emotional cues that you had and said, Mama said we can't go over there. Because you found a safe space with him to share what had been happening to you. And he stepped up and said, No, nah, we ain't we ain't going there. Yeah. And then I knew you, he was gonna do this. Well, I, I, I was. You did this to me. I know what we're gonna talk about. I, I know nothing. We. I said I, before we start recording. I said I know what we're gonna talk about. But it starts. It's, it's making sense to me now. Is that then you're raised with your father? Most men ain't gonna give you no feminine energy. He gonna give you straight masculinity. Hey, he gonna provide. He gonna do that stuff or whatever. But. You know, uh, was he the type that nurtured you? And come here, baby, let me give you yes. a kiss and hug on you. He so, was. So you got that balance. And then you get married. And you're looking for all of that to converge, which it should be. When you get married, your husband is supposed to be the priest, the protector of your home. The person that says, I got you when nobody else does. And then you get into this relationship and the foundation is shaky from the very beginning. Start off really great. Oh, it's kind of cute, whatever. But then here y'all are living in two different uh, states. Y'all trying to make it work through all of that. Uh, y'all deal with what relationships deal with. And uh, and then you have uh, physical abuse that becomes a part of it, emotional abuse, all this other little stuff. And it's like, here we go. This is what I've been through as in my childhood. At what age did your was your brother's life taken? How old was he? He was um, 28, 29. Was that your older brother? It was. Yep. My big brother. Yep, 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 yep. The one that when I would go home to Detroit, like the neighborhood boys wouldn't talk to me because they don't, they they don't, don't play. They don't want that smoke. <laughs> They'd be like, you... Man, no, uh -uh. that's so and so sister, man. Oh, you... oh. yeah. What's the, what they used to say when I come home for the summer? Oh, that Alabama. Oh, don't talk. You know, that's real sister. That's real sister. Don't. Mm -mm. There's gonna be problems. Oh yeah. <laughs> <sighs> so you say he was murdered brutally in Detroit. Was it some foul play? Was he involved in some stuff illegal or what was um, that whole situation? He was in a. Uh, like a car club or something like that. And some other stuff, it's so many holes in that story. But ultimately, he was shot 
by somebody that was supposed to be a part of his crew, friend, and then they burned his body up in the house. Doesn't it? Yeah, Two weeks you. before I was supposed to graduate from college. So I was a complete zombie walking around L.A. campus. But I walked. And graduated. I did. And yeah, as you've been going through healing for this and going through therapy or whatever, uh, how's that process been going? Are you, you feel like you're on the other side of the hump? You know, I'm as, it, it's dealing with everything that's going on in life. Like, it's just, like I said, 2023 was a, but did you die? Yeah. You know, every time I feel like I get to a good space, like I pray to God, like, please just stop. Like, make the storm stop. Like, I just want it to stop. I don't know how much more I can take. And then something else happened. And then the arrest happened. And then the divorce reopened. All those things that are going on and people don't, people see me and they think, or, you know, even watching the last season of the show, watching myself, I didn't even recognize myself. Why you say that? I was being triggered and I didn't understand what it was. I would go into myself. I would have moments where I would be aggressive which is a part of my personality. It just is. And, um, it, but it was being triggered. It's things that I don't normally, you know, I wouldn't normally do after what I perceive to be healing. But in my prayers of asking for the storms to stop, they didn't stop. But as you said, I didn't look like I was embarrassed in that video when I turned myself in. God didn't take the storms away, but he gave me peace. And I, I just didn't understand. It was like, whether what's the, you know, you know the scripture. Peace what? that surpasses all, all understanding. understanding. Yeah. And even though it, the, the, the life keep on life, I'm in a, a more peaceful space. Um, but it still work. Still work to, a lot of work to be done. So you look back at that show. You said you see, you can see the triggers now. I You're can. able to look and be like, yeah, like for me to have a conversation off camera with someone that I deemed a friend and then come into a scene and like, wait a minute, we I thought we fixed that. We beefing? Like, why didn't I why didn't I know we were beefing? The camera started rolling and now we got a beef again. And so, you know, it being on reality TV is kind of like you never know what your reality is. Even with dating, it's like, what are you here for? What you want? And people don't know that people <laughs> people don't know it. every friend that I have that have been on a reality show, whether it's dating, whether it's Housewives of Atlanta, all them type of shows, they all be like, y'all don't understand. Like they, it's it's a different world. That's why y'all can't get me on that. Y'all y'all <laughs> y'all gonna see a different side of me because what happens? That's what I'm saying. You yeah. get in a pressure cooker. And people are like, well, how does she have an attitude about that, and why does she respond? Because they're good at creating scenarios to trigger you. They need good TV. That's the reason why I can't I can't do it. That's why people are like, hey, yeah, I, I said I ain't gonna be able to do it because because <laughs> you gonna push me a certain way and I'm a snap. You are gonna be like, different your wife is who is that? I don't even curse, but you are gonna hear me curse. <laughs> you are gonna I don't even curse as a person but you put me in that right situation I'm gonna cut somebody out I'm gonna body slam somebody you'll be like what is wrong with him it's I thought he was saved I'm saved and he just got whooped that quick <laughs> amen ah, and we're gonna drugged. see that church on Sunday well it's funny because I said that in one of my green screens and they were asking me like I was triggered in the situation where this Galentine's Day we you talked about that you were like wait a minute what you did what and <laughs> And I was like, you know, I was sitting there in my green screen and as I was processing, I was like, I haven't been put in situations like this like this since I was in high school. Yeah. And wait a minute, who you what who you talking? Who? So, you know. I said, this new, you 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 going to fight somebody?" He's like, "I will." I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Can we fight nobody as grown as we are?" I said, "My big grown age, I shouldn't have to." <laughs> but I ain't no part. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It's like stuff that you ain't never even thought about doing as old as we are trying to fight somebody. No, like, you're not. And then what you know, got on the TV show and you've been fighting from the world. <laughs> Trigger. But you know what? It also, it, I, I'm happy that I got a chance to see it because it, it it allowed me to know, hey, you still got some work to do. Yeah. You got to dig a little bit deeper. And um, I'm grateful for it all. As crazy as it was. Um, but you know, I really, I enjoyed the the process of being on uh reality TV it, it was a lot of fun moments and I think just because I was dealing with so much 
going through my divorce and then my dad getting cancer and it was just a lot. And a lot of times people don't see that. No. They just see, oh, okay, here's this scene and they look cute and they're at the store and wait a minute, why does she have attitude? <laughs> and what what's she mad at her for? She shouldn't be mad at her. Like I'm like, but y'all don't know all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and then we got life on top of that, the real life outside of your reality TV exactly. life. Exactly. And yeah. it's it's um it's been interesting to watch, and it I would have never saw myself in that in that light if I did, wasn't on TV. So. Would you do it again? Um, I I would. To... If they asked you to come on that show, would you co- would you come back? <laughs> Her face changed. I would. I would because I feel like my story is unfinished. The only way that I would is if they if they told my story the right way. And um, yeah, and and I would. I would Are wanna... you healed enough to go in there and not act a complete well, fool? Well, uh, a complete fool. Well, I've never acted a complete yeah, fool. They, if, if they know, see, this is the thing about it. When the when the it ain't calling them the devil or nothing, but I'm saying when the devil knows your trigger points, they'll cook the perfect scenario up for you and be like, "Oh, I know. I've heard. I see what happens." And they uh, I ain't gonna name the show, but it's this particular show. Is a reality show that they have the people talk to a, a, a therapist, a freaking psychologist, actually, and they sit down and talk to you to vet you or whatever. It's a dating show. And you're thinking you're talking about, like, okay, well, I guess they're trying to find out if I'm, you know, make a great partner they or whatever. The info. They collect and they data. They're trying to see how your mind works. So that they know, oh, they said that their greatest fear is this, or they hate people like this, or this makes them. They're like, well, what would make you snap on somebody? If somebody came and they disrespect me and said something about my kids, then they'll put somebody up there and they'll say something. They'll be like, well, yeah, I don't date no one with kids. Hold on, what y'all say about my kids? And then now you have this crazy situation that happens where you're triggered in the worst way and we're watching as viewers saying gosh she's so overreacting on that <laughs> you know it's like why she act like why would she care absolutely. what this person thinks but then put the perfect scenario where you like why in the world did you respond like that because it, granted as self-aware as i am you put me in the wrong situation or right by a producer standpoint you're gonna get the reaction that you want i want to get to the point to where I'm like, Jesus? Well, heck, even Jesus went and tore up the temples. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, he was like, that was a scenario for Jesus. If he was on a reality show, you'd have saw Jesus go tear up the temple. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Here's the reality show. Jesus done walked up in the church and started throwing tables over. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what kind of PR does that look like for Jesus? Hey, we're going to have to work on that, Jesus. Hold <laughs> Jesus on. you got to work on that. You got to tip it now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so that's what happens in the right situation. We're going to respond in ways that may be uh, unbecoming. And so my thing is, when I ask you, would you go back on there? Do you think that you're in a place to where no one could push those triggers? Um, I think I'm in a great place. Yeah, I, I think that. Um, <laughs> who savage mode? Um, I think I'm in. A, I'm in a great place. The funny thing you talk about producer, you said that people. Um, you know, with this show was a, a therapist. Yeah. So it's, it was a recent situation. I bring it up because it's very, very recent. Is imagine confiding in the the person that they have assigned to be your producer, and then you find out that producer married your ex. Oh yeah, that that that, that that's a. It's not an imagine. That's not imaginary. That's actually what happened to you, Destiny. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 actually what happened to you, Destiny. So uh, what? What is it? Really yeah, that, that happened, Destiny, um, last month, I believe. <laughs> last month, this guy that you was dating uh, is now married. Are they engaged? They just engaged, right? Um, or did they get married? I think they might be married. Okay, might be married then. Married, the producer, one of the producers of the show. That was a sign to you. How you feel about that? Well, being that she told me that was her cousin. It was really interesting to know that that cousins was married. And I, I know we filmed in Alabama, but I uh, she didn't say that the dude was her cousin. He said she said that to you. So the thing that's crazy is that you know the the job of a producer that's assigned to you, a field producer, is for them to you know you give them you confide in them. Yeah. You tell and. And not only was she my producer, we actually became friends after she left the show. And um, <laughs> she would say things to me like when I would have those moments like, this is crazy, I'm sick of this. And, 
Then she would say things like, you know, you know how many girls wanna, would love to be in your position and you know how many girls would love to be on television. And I didn't think she was talking about herself. The whole time I'm like, That's... and so then when I found out the cousins got married, she did not I, say that was her cousin. She she done told you. So did he say that was her cousin too? They the the word was we people. Like they you know they, they, uh, like I know like man, that's my people. Yeah, like we got cousins and so I'm thinking real real for real like real talk like I in a million years like I didn't know, and then I get a text message where it's like hey uh out of respect for you and our friendship and as a woman I want to tell you that it, we we getting serious I'm like when did y'all. Were you and your cousin? When did y'all get? When did y'all even start dating? What are you talking about? Because real talk, like I knew that the man wasn't my husband. We had already broken up. Let's 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 say that I had already ended the relationship, and it was just a lot of things that were red flags, and I wasn't going back down that road again. And then a long distance on top of that. So, but you like the long distance relationships, huh? I actually did, because you know I like to be. I'm, like, I'm an only child. My dad's only child. And so I'm used to, after my dad got custody of me, I'm like, I'm used to being, but that's another story. And so the thing that, about the whole situation, <laughs> I've known that man for over 15 years. Y'all go way back. Way back. And then I had to look at that relationship like, now these people are creating a storyline around me. What this is my real you? life. Like, they're trying to like pitch a show, I think, or something. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know. And then I, I go back to 15 plus years ago when I was dating someone that was actually a celebrity, a rapper, and off and on. And then that's when he first heavily pursued me. Oh, the guy that you started dating. Yeah. And then now here we are, fast forward, I'm on television and he's <laughs> heavily pursuing me again. So then I had to think about what was the real intention? Like, were you ever who I thought you were? And what I can say about the situation is, it is what it is. People find themselves in situations and they ain't got nothing. To, well, it do got a lot to do with me because it's a whole storyline. But uh, got people be people will create storylines around your reality and 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 use it for you know gain clout attention. How long y'all broken up at that point? Mm, probably about five months, maybe. And do you feel like it's betrayal on who part? His part or her part or both? both? Wow. Because I, you know, we got to, when I said we continued a relationship, I got messages on my phone. You know, I love you, sis. Miss you, sis. You know, birthday, surprise birthday parties I was invited to by her sister. Like, things like that. So it was a developing relationship. And I confided in her about my relationship, not only as my producer, but as my friend. And, um, but the biggest betrayal is him. Because we had... I knew, like I said, I knew the relationship wasn't going where it needed to go as far as marriage or anything like that. But that was still my friend. So answer this. How would you have responded if she came to you or both of them came to you and said, hey, listen, she, uh, we are interested in each other. We're at the interest stage. We haven't even been on a date with each other. But I'm interested in her. She's interested in me. Do you mind if we pursue this? What would you say? Who, Jesus? Uh... <laughs> I can tell you what I said on the day that I found out, but that's no, probably that's, that's, that's hindsight. You got to go by at the beginning. If they did things I don't know. right, listen, would you would you would you say, oh, think, we 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 done this five months ago? We, we ain't I ain't gonna say I'm gonna say that now, but I probably eventually would have got to a point where I respected it, you know. But at that moment, would you say no? I can't tell you because I am not in that moment. Well, and you, I can't tell you, two grown people no. But I, at the end of the day, I would have I respect honesty versus betrayal and sneaking. Right. And so for me, it's like the the worst part about the situation is that I know that that friendship can never, the door is closed. Like right. him and I can never be friends again because of betrayal. And that's the that's the part that, that stung the most. That you felt betrayed. Yeah. But had they asked you at the beginning, you don't know what you would have said. And because my thing is, I, I wonder like. The Detroit hat came out of, but um, no, I'm sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> we gotta get you delivered from Detroit. We gotta get you delivered from the. They from can't the... take the girl out of Detroit. We can't take Detroit out of the girl. <laughs> <laughs> Motor City. So what happens is this. So my thing is, I always say people find love however they find love. And if then you said it key, you said we realized we weren't each other's person. Basically, mm -hmm. that's not my husband. 
And so my thing is, once that is understood, is it okay for that person to be released to date whoever they date, be with whoever they be with, and it not be a betrayal? Like, it's different you in this can't situation. Use that situation. Well, that I can't use it. that because it was a whole show. She's your confidence producer. And then it all became that. so, I mean, why is it public? Why is it on the internet? You know, that type of thing. Why is it a story? Because if I fell in love with someone that I would, I wouldn't put my, I pray to God, don't put myself in a situation like that, but somebody that I considered a friend, their ex or whatever the case may be, um, you would kind of want to maybe protect that and be silent and like really build it up and like really make it a thing. But it's like more of a, an attention seeking situation. Well, if you said they try to make a storyline of a show, if it's something... It I don't happens. know what it is, okay. but it just became like, you know, hey, hey, we see you the next day, they in the kitchen getting married, and I'm like, what is going on? What? Would it be worse if you didn't know, and you just found out that it's kind of hidden two years later, you found out they've been married for two years? Um, I don't know. That's what okay. I'm saying. It's almost like... I'm just saying you can't... It's, it's, it's such a situation where you just really... There's no right or wrong. It, it's, it, it's just wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. It ain't no right. It's just wrong. <laughs> That's why I said the only thing that could have been better handled is if they would have had a conversation. Yes, with you. absolutely. And however you dealt with that is up to you. But then they but be you, like, listen. You saying you getting serious, and then two days later you getting married, and it's all over the internet. Like, how is that? What? Because you're saying, because you're saying, basically, must have started before that moment. You know, everything starts before the moment that you see it. And so whatever happened, wherever the courtship started, it started way in advance, and then you see the fruit of it later. Because it ain't like that happened in 30 days. You never know. We in a whole other world these days. That man did not just see that girl and get married to a five Well, they met at my birthday dinner, so they definitely didn't just see each other. They met at your birthday dinner when, Destiny? Last How, year. You're talking about 2023. Was that 2023? What year is this? Yeah. No. The year before that. Oh, 2022. I think so. I think it was. your birthday then. Mm-hmm. Were they, did they exchange numbers then? Where it was like. No, she was. Uh, I thought she was dating his cousin. Let me just be quiet. So That's everybody me. was there kind of coupled up. So. I don't know. Okay. We don't know. So what happened is she was dating somebody at the time. She was my producer. She showed up as my producer. And she knew somebody that was there that they dated, I guess. And so I'm, and then to find out, I'm, it's just a lot of stuff that just don't make sense, but it ain't none of my business now. Do you forgive them? God bless them on, on there. Do you forgive them? Yes. Don't <laughs> just say it. <laughs> I was skeptical. We used to do this game in acting. We called skeptical, and I like that. Rihanna wasn't that kind of skeptical. We got, <laughs> <laughs> Rihanna! <laughs> She's talking about, mm, yeah, I do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we're going to get to that stage. We're going to get to that stage at the end of the day. You know, it's 2024. You got no, no, really, seriously. Yeah. I mean, it's their life is no longer a part of mine, so I wish them I wish them well. And you will still go on that show knowing that you'll be in, in, in that... I don't know about the, hey, the, about welcome that. to my world. Yeah. This, you got to confide in producers and not trust them. You, It's a lot. And then you'll go back on that same show and then watch them now married, and this is a guy that you dated. That'd be that'd be. They not tricky. on the show? What are you talking about? No, they ain't on the show. You said she's a producer for the same show, ain't she? Not in, no, not anymore. Okay, she ain't produced on the show no more. Okay. Well, that's, that makes it a whole lot easier then. <laughs> Why do you look like that? That you think? Look, <laughs> why do you look me? <laughs> I just things flash through my head, you know. Things I'm thinking about. It's okay. Destiny, do you mm-hmm. desire to get married again? I would love to know what marriage is like. <laughs> why are you laughing? Because you've been married before. <laughs> I've been married, but I've never been in a marriage. Woo! Mm-hmm. Unpack that, Destiny. Um, I just said one, the one. I mean, do I gotta unpack it? All the stuff I went through, I done told you some some key things that made it not a marriage. What do you believe that the right marriage will afford you that this past marriage didn't? That I won't have to be a thug in my marriage. No, just kidding. But for that's real, that's true. That's real. That's real. <laughs> you want to rest in your femininity? Oh, um, that part. Yeah. Um, I would say 
<laughs> protection, provision, um, being provided a space to just feel safe. Do you feel like you're able to be that? Can, are you able to wait and to exhale? Are you w willing to lay down your sword and be like, or is that going to be you're a gonna struggle? You're going to have to be a, yep. I can't say the word. Yeah. You're you going to have to be a heck of a man. <laughs> say it. A heck of a man. Oh, man. Like a real one. Not a sassy one either. <laughs> mm -mm. To get you to get you to to rest. Mm -hmm. Now I've, I've I've been dating and it's it's an interesting world. Uh, you know, girl got options, <laughs> got choices, and they're you know I don't I don't feel like they they mimic any other situation. Thank God uh, that I've been in previously. No love bombing. No you know some 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 secure men. So. You know, I do have to learn how to kind of lay down the sword because I'll be moving the couch and they're like, "What you doing? What? What? what why are you moving that?" I'm like, "What is? I got to try to move it to the other side of the room. Let me help you. Like, Good. what is that? Good. What is that? You want to help? help me move my couch? <laughs> okay. All right. I like you. <laughs> oh God, it's so hilarious. So marriage, you still desire it. You want you you want I desire to. a marriage, yes. All right. So it ain't like you jaded. I haven't given up on love. You haven't given up on no. love. Um are you extra protective now since you are dating with child versus before Ooh. you got married? Ugh. Straight up mama, mama bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At what stage do you feel like it's appropriate to introduce uh law to Listen, I am taking the training wheels off of this dating thing. I don't know. I'm real clumsy right now. I'm trying yeah. to figure this thing out. I don't know what stage it is because it's like when I have my son, it's like dating. Who? Hey, how you doing? Are you alive over there? Because I'm all mama. So I got to find a balance. Got to find a balance. <sighs> well, I do want to. Um, I, I just want to talk to your to your ex husband, brother. Um, oh, Jesus, uh... brother. Cause I got to talk to, you know, I, I got to keep my Kings lifted up because I am a huge advocate for a healthy family, uh, healthy families, especially black families. Um, and I always say that our kids are witnessing how we are loving or not loving their mothers and kids don't choose size. I'm telling you, they don't, they'll, they'll, they, they love both parents equally until they start seeing Hey, you're treating my mom like this, or you're treating my dad like this. Why can't they, you know, the old Rodney King thing? Why can't we all just get along? That's what kids really want. And so the marriage didn't work. I understand that. But there still should be some type of healthiness in um, co parenting. And so I just wanna encourage you, brother, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to encourage you, brother, to, uh, as Destiny over here making all these noises. Why, why, why you making these noises, Destiny? You don't think this is this? You don't think this is this? This, this is uh, you you feel like this is just a waste of time. Put your energy out there, sir. I'm not gonna interfere. <laughs> Destiny, mm -hmm. I'm gonna need you not to be making them sound effects. Well, I didn't know you could hear me. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, Amen. See, see, doing I'm just like praying that. because that's necessary in this moment. Think about that. What 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 happens if this moment changes the trajectory? Of y'all's co-parenting relationship. You would literally be Jesus. You walk on water. Well, I'm believing that I'm Christ-like as a Christian. And that I believe that as one brother to the next, I can encourage you, King, to uh, just, just make it healthy. Whatever you've been through, whatever y'all's relationship has been through for the previous years, you know, um, and I'll say this, I'll be transparent. My daughter had a surgery last month. Uh, the mother of my child that's not the woman I was married to, but a woman that uh, I had a, my daughter with when I was in high school. Her mom, you know, we've had a tumultuous relationship going, you know, throughout the years. But my daughter called me yesterday. She said, my mom said that she enjoyed talking to you at the hospital. Y'all was just having so much fun and y'all was tripping out or whatever. I have been so intentional on making sure that no matter what, we had a healthy relationship. And it hasn't been healthy all the time. But I kept saying, I'm a my daughter one day told me, she said, How how are you able to respond to my my mom like this in times or whatever? I said, Because I want to show you my love towards you by the way I handle your mom. 
So brother, I encourage you to love your son by the way you love her, love his mom. Love your son by the way that you love his mom. Doesn't mean you got to call all the time. Doesn't mean all that Please type don't. stuff, but just Destiny. I'm sorry. Destiny, you, you see? I'm sorry. No sound effects. See, see, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect in none of this. Talk about, please still don't. working on me, I'm Lord. talking to my brother right oh, here. Oh, sorry. Yes. So you don't have to call every day, but what you can do is when you do talk to her, when you do send her a text, you know, it can be healthy. Whatever y'all dealing with from a court situation, drop all that mess. In that stuff, let's, let, let's move in 2024 with a place of resolution and peace. And I guarantee you what you're going to deposit into her by just loving her with respect and honor God is going to return that back to you. You're going to find yourself living a more peaceful life. Just, just check all that stuff. It don't even make sense. So I'm believing God for y'all's relationship to become healthy so that y'all can raise up this awesome son in a very so productive cute. home environment. Now, I don't believe that that was wasted. I pray. Watch, watch, watch. How would you feel if you end up dropping this whole case? Yes, Lord. How would you feel? Um, I mean. Would you still operate? Think about it, because if there's a miracle that takes place, if he just says, man, listen, I'm through with this. I ain't going to deal with this or whatever. He dropped everything. Would that instill a little bit of hope on y'all having a healthier co-parenting relationship? Or would you be like, well, what you finna do next? I know you, you up to something. Would you operate in bitterness? No, because I'm always surprised by the things that come out. Yeah, they come at me. I'm, I'm like, why am I still surprised by this stuff? Like, but I'm so talking no, about from a operate. healthy standpoint. I don't operate in, in you, bitterness. You ain't surprised by the negative, but what about the positive? He starts doing positive strides. Would that help? Uh, that's making me emotional. Would that help? Would that help heal y'all's family relationship? Absolutely, it would, and it will help heal um, a lot of things. So that's what we're gonna believe for. You're okay. a Christian woman, right? Absolutely. Can we pray? Absolutely. So I want you to pray. Get me the other hand. I want Ooh, you to ask Christian. I want you to sit, sit right there in front of that microphone. Okay. And I want you, I want you to pray over your relationship. With? Your, your family relationship, your family structure. Oh, Lord, fix it. That's fix the, it, Lord. Is that the end of the prayer? We ask for your continued protection, grace, and mercy. Amen. And Heavenly Father, I just cover that prayer. God, I ask that you, nothing is too impossible for you. You say we're two or more gathered in your name. There shall you be in the midst. So, Lord, we believe right now in the name of Jesus. We, we come against every confusing spirit. We counsel every demonic spirit that has been trying to come against this family. And, God, we speak healing right now in the name of Jesus. Right now in the name of Jesus. You said it's not by power nor by might, but by thy spirit, said the Lord. So, Lord, we ask that your spirit intervene in this situation. And I want to hear an amazing testimony come forth from this, God. I thank you in advance for the, the praise report that's going to come forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, y'all, you, you think you know, I ain't got time to play with you, Destiny. I'm, watching. I'm not playing. I want God. I'm telling you, I believe that God is going to do something. I, I believe it. I believe it. How can people stay connected with you? Um, you can stay connected with me. I started a podcast called The Unbreakable Podcast. The Unbreakable. I have a candle line that is um, basically a, a pays homage to The Unbreakable. It looks broken, but it is not. Put it back together. And I always call it, um, the, the candle is me reigniting my flame for life. I like that. And um, you can find me on social media at The Destiny Payton on all handles, IG, TikTok, uh, Twitter, all of those places. The Destiny Payton. The Destiny Payton. And how can I get those candles? MadonnaBeauty.com. M-A-D-O-N-N-I Beauty.com. Madonna? Madani. Madani Beauty.com. Correct. Um, thank you, Destiny. Thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for being transparent. Uh, before we close out, you said that during the last panel that we did <laughs> at New Birth, what were your thoughts during that panel discussion? Oh, Lord, I got a lot more healing to do. And, and what made you say that? <laughs> because, you know, I kind of, I was, uh, it was a lot of good conversations, a lot of things that were flowing in that room, a lot of great things that I received from that panel. And, um, you know, some of the responses that they gave was not what I was thinking in my head. So <laughs> I'm like, yep, got a lot more healing to do. 
Well, well I'm we'll glad work. that you're self-aware about that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because if you're aware about it, then that's where the work begins. Destiny, thank you so much for blessing our thank listeners of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. And I, I wish you the best. Don't get me in trouble with this podcast. Thank you. I don't think you said anything, right? You don't, do you feel like you said anything that would incriminate you in court? Not in court. You know what I'm saying? But all the other little stuff, we're going to... We, gonna, we, we gonna, prayed for we, it. We're going to pray for everything. I just don't. I just want to make sure that, that, like you said, your attorney ain't going to box you when you get back. No, you didn't say something. Time for so that. You, you didn't say nothing bad on that. Uh, but we good. I feel good. Okay. Y'all give it up for my homie. That's the pain. <laughs> Thank y'all. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy, the likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical context, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTerris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today.
Man, when I tell you, I really enjoyed that episode with Destiny Payton. Um, I like it when people are able to be vulnerable. We keep it lit. We live intensely and transparently. And so, um, yeah, I just want to see black families healed. I want us to pass down generational healing instead of generational curses. Well, here's my favorite part of the podcast where I speak to my future wifey. Dear future wifey, when my eyes crack open to unveil a new day, thoughts of you instantly flood my mind. I look forward to the moment when the Lord calls attendance and say, and you say, present. Finally joining me in the classroom of love. I envision our home as a haven, a place where laughter reverberates through the walls and where tears are met with understanding. I want you to feel a sense of security in my embrace, knowing that you can be vulnerable without fear of judgment, your heart is a treasure, and I promise to handle it with the utmost care. Communication is the bedrock of any meaningful relationship, and I vow to foster an environment where open dialogue is not just encouraged, but cherished. Your thoughts, dreams, and fears are important to me, and I promise to listen with an open heart, free of judgment. Let our home be a space where we can share the deepest recesses of our souls knowing that we are accepted and loved for who we are. With all my love and anticipation, your future hubby. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.